Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kirsten Conan, who is a uh, visiting scholar for our Grand Rounds series. She is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. In her work, Dr. Conan uh, aims to reduce uh, the population burden of mental disorders through re research, training, and advocacy. She's passionate about using science to overcome violence and trauma, which are uh, major preventable causes of health problems globally. Her research focus is threefold. First, she studies why some people develop PTSD and related mental and physical health problems, and why some people are resilient when exposed to similar traumatic events. She's the co-principal investigator of the NIMH funding Aurora study led by uh, Dr. Samuel McLean with Drs. Ron Kessler and our own Carrie Ressler. She also co-leads the PTSD working group for the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, which aims to identify genetic variants that increase risk and resilience following traumatic exposure. Second, she investigates how violence, trauma, and PTSD alter long-term physical health and accelerate aging. Much of this work is done in collaboration with the Nurses' Health Study. And third, she aims to expand access to evidence-based mental health treatment for survivors of violence and trauma. To this end, she co-wrote a book, Treating Survivors of Childhood Abuse, Psychotherapy for the Interrupted Life, with Drs. Uh, Marilyn uh, Kloitscher and uh, Lisa Cohen. And she is going to speak with us about PTSD and women's health life course burden within and across generations. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Conan. Well, thank you all for coming and thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to focus on the, the second area of my research um, that was mentioned, um, the intersection of trauma and violence, mental health and physical health, and then also talk about treatment um, because I, I was expecting that there might be a lot of clinicians in the audience um, and uh, so I wanted to include that. Um, so I have no disclosures. Um, so, since when I first began my work on trauma and PTSD in graduate school, if I got on a plane, for example, and people asked what I was studying, and I said I was studying trauma, people assumed that I was studying veterans. Um, this was maybe 20, 30 years ago. And um, now, if you, if you, it seems every day we hear about trauma and PTSD on the news, there's mass, tra mass traumatic events like whether it's shootings or disasters or terrorist attacks or a war. And so it's really in the public mind in a different way than when I started studying it. So um, the focus of this talk is going to be on the central part of my work, which is that trauma adversely affects women's health, both within the woman herself and extends across, her, across generations to her offspring. So just um, to start, um, one of the things we know from epidemiology over the last 20 years is that trauma exposure is common. Um, maybe back in the, in the 80s, um, or the early 80s, uh, trauma, when it was in DSM-3, was thought of as an, an unusual human experience. But one of the things epidemiology has shown us is that it's common. So these are data from the World Mental Health Surveys, and um, the gray is the countries that weren't included um, in these data. But in every country in the world that was studied, um, where they did population-based surveys, over half of the people in that country were studied had it had at least one traumatic event. And if we even just look in the US, over 50% of the US population has two or more traumatic events. So again, being exposed to trauma is an extremely common experience. The other thing we know is that trauma doesn't happen randomly over to people or randomly over the life course. It's that um, you, the youth are particularly vulnerable. So if we look at something like, um, if we look at uh, trauma by when it occurs in the, in the life course, you can see that um, some of the worst traumas, especially interpersonal violence, interpersonal violence, over half of the interpersonal violence that occurs, this is global, this is globally, will have occurred by the age of 18. So about 60% will have occurred by the age of 18, meaning that the young are disproportionately exposed to interpersonal violence and accidents 
while other events, um, like death of a loved one, are more, more consistently experienced over the life course. So in some ways, these things that are particularly bad, like violence, are happening to those most vulnerable. The other thing we know is that trauma exposure disproportionately burdens women. So um, men are more likely to experience any traumatic event. When we give a list, usually uh, men have overall, if you say any, they have more. But women are more likely to experience high impact events. So you can see that here, like for example, sexual abuse and rape, much more common among women, which I'm sure you know. And the events that are more common among women are more, more likely to uh, result in post-traumatic stress disorder. So these are summary data from a whole bunch of different kinds of studies. And what they show here is that, for example, for an event like rape, um, about half of the people who were raped will develop PTSD. It's actually pretty true of men or women, actually. Um, similarly for childhood abuse, um, but if you look at other events that are more common, like accidents, um, it's a much, much a smaller proportion will develop PTSD. Um, and the other thing we know about um, violence, and uh, women, women disproportionately experience violence, but we also know that recovery from PTSD related to violence is slower than that for other traumatic events. So these are recovery curves from, these are also global from the World Mental Health Surveys, and so they look at um, what proportion of people are still in the PTSD episode after how many years. And you can see if you look at war-related trauma, physical violence, and, and intimate partner violence, these top ones, that people stay in the episode, a greater proportion stay in the episode for a longer period of time than for other kinds of traumas, for example, like accidents. And we also know that violence accounts for over half the PTSD burden globally. So the way we um, study this is um, we look at percent of PTSD months in the population explained by certain events. So we don't just count people, because if I have PTSD for three months and you have PTSD for two years, we can't really say that's equal. So we take, to, take all the PTSD in months in the population and look at which events explain those months in the population. And you can see here that, um, again, these are global data from World Mental Health Surveys, that um, Interpersonal violence, intimate partner sexual violence, um, causing or witnessing bodily harm and collective violence account for the majority of PTSD months in the population. Um, and this is, um, this is accidents and injuries, and this is unexpected death of a loved one. Um, and you can see this is also true we just look at the U.S. population. And so the other thing we know um, is that trauma and PTSD alter women's traje health trajectories over the life course. So I think people here are probably very aware of the mental health consequences of trauma and violence, PTSD, but there's also depression and pretty much every other disorder has been linked to that. You know, I focus on PTSD. Um, but the thing that we've been studying the last few years is how does this impact women's physical health? And I was telling Chris before, I became interested in this because as a graduate student, I did one of my practica at the Boston VA in the Women's Health Sciences Division. And what I saw was the patients there had a lot of comorbid mental and physical health problems. And I was a student, I just became very interested in that. What was, you know, what, what happened first, how the um, mental, mental health problems affected their physical health problems, et cetera. So it became an area of interest from the patients I saw at that time. And then I had an opportunity, and when I moved to Harvard in the Nurses Health Study, which is a large cohort of um, women, um, it started in 1989 and they're still being followed, um, where they've actually were set up to look at lifestyle factors in women's health. So there's a lot of strengths at this cohort. One, it's very large. Um, two is that it um, uses, it, it surveys women every two years. And then third is that they gather medical records on the women. So we don't just rely on asking women, oh, have, do you have diabetes? We do ask that. But we also get their medical records and have um, medical diagnosis verified independently. So um, I've been able to nest my work on trauma and PTSD and mental health in this cohort to be able to look at the effects of trauma and PTSD on physical health over the women's life course. Um, and so we've done an, uh, a bunch of different work here um, and looking at, we've been in, we were interested originally in looking at you know, PTSD and physical health, particularly heart disease. 
Um, and then also the pathways that lead from PTSD to other, to heart disease. For example, lifestyle factors, behaviors, and then biological pathways. And I'll just briefly talk about some of this work. Okay. Okay, so talk starting with the health behaviors. So one of the things we found was that women who develop PTSD reduce their physical activity. So one of the things that's nice about this cohort, again, is it's been followed over, over 30 years. So you get to, and you can look, for example, at women's physical activity before they develop PTSD and after to see if it changes. And so what we find here is that um, before, these are women who, um, before they experience a trauma and or develop PTSD, that you can't tell the difference. So women who are gonna go on to experience a trauma don't look any different in terms of exercise than women who aren't gonna be. These aren't all different. But after women experience a trauma, those who develop PTSD or the more severe symptoms, this is a screen we use, um, they rapidly decrease their physical activity. The other groups don't. So um, we don't know, this is observational epidemiologic data, we don't know why. When we talk to the women, some of the things they say is, um, say our um, some women, their PTSD, one of their symptoms is restricting their lifestyle. So maybe they used to go out, they used to go running, they used to, and now they're, so they're avoiding things so they stay in. Another thing that was interesting to me, which may not, it surprised me, it may not surprise people here, is that a number of women talked about how physical activity was triggering to them. So the sort of cardiovascular effects of physical activity felt like panic, like it would, it would in, induce a panic response in them. So there could be a lot of different reasons, but um, this is important because we actually know that exercise has a, physical activity has a very positive effect on mental health. And it seems in these cases that women's uh, mental health problems are um, resulting in decreased physical activity. So we also looked at other factors, for example, body mass index, and what we found is that um, PTSD at baseline in the cohort is associated with higher BMI. But most importantly, women with PTSD have more rapid increase in BMI over time. And you can see that here. So again, like those exercises, that the, what I showed with physical activity, we can look at women's um, BMI uh, weight gain before she has PTSD and after. And what we find is, um, if we look at slopes of BMI, we can see that before PTSD onset, there's no difference in slopes. So women who are gonna go on to develop PTSD don't have more rapid weight gain, uh, which you know, is not surprising. But then after they develop PTSD, they tend to gain weight more rapidly than women who are trauma exposed but don't develop PTSD. So something about PTSD also, I mean, that could be the exercise. It doesn't seem to be, ex this like includes exercise, doesn't seem to be explained by exercise, but there seems to be this more rapid weight gain. Um, and we've also looked at some other things, which I diet and things which I could um, talk about if people have questions. Um, then we've also looked at um, different aspects of the stress response system and different biological pathways um, in addition to the health behavior. So I'll just talk about a couple things we've looked at, like one thing we looked at. So one of the things we've been interested, a lot of people are interested, is in inflammation and the relationship with PTSD. And what we found that in, in, the, in these women, that women with chronic PTSD have um, higher inflammation over time, and we're able to look at the levels of inflammation over time than women with trauma and no PTSD or no trauma. And that may explain part of this effect we're seeing on physical health. And then finally, we've done a number of studies looking at a wide range of physical health outcomes. So um, we started with cardiovascular disease, and we found that um, trauma, four plus symptoms is our screen positive for PTSD that women who experienced PTSD had increased risk of myocardial infarction and stroke. And I think the strength of these data are these are medically record, me medical record verified MIs and strokes, so not, um, not women who have PTSD also saying, oh yes, I've had an MI. Um, so they're independently verified. And we've seen this now with also a number of other uh, diseases. So these are women, this is, um, these are um, cumulative incidence curves, and we've seen that, for example, the women with highest PTSD symptoms, this is six plus, have the greatest incidence of diabetes in the cohort, and um, much higher than women with no trauma or trauma but no symptoms. Um, and then other folks have gone on now to look at other diseases um, beyond cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So for example, um, one investigator looked at lupus and found that women with PTSD had higher risk of lupus. Um, 
and that um, this was very this is very much associated with the if you looked at trauma exposed versus no women with trauma also had higher risk of lupus. So there's been a wide range of adverse health effects of PTSD in these women that we've observed. Most recently, we've been really interested in, because we've seen these effects across all these different health outcomes, we've been interested in whether PTSD accelerates aging more broadly, rather than looking just at specific health. Because we see these health outcomes, we see it very consistently no matter what health outcome we look at. And one of the reasons we got interested in is we ran a pilot study in this cohort looking at PTSD in telomere length. Um, so telomere length is um, thought to be one sort of biomarker of aging um, and is related to a lot of the outcomes I talked about. Uh, lower telomere length is, is related to increased mortality, et cetera. Um, and what we found was that women with PTSD had shorter telomeres than women with no PTSD. Um, and that we also found that there's a little bit of evidence that maybe some, some of the more violent, the violence-related traumas were also associated with shorter telomeres. So we wanted to look at other aspects of aging in these women to see if we saw the, a broader accelerated aging effect. So we did, we did the COG state brief battery. So we did a um, web-based battery in the, in the women in this cohort. And we looked at these four tasks. So one is a set of um, detection and identification tasks, which get at psychomotor speed and attention. And the other card is a one, other tasks are one card learning and one back task that do learning and working memory. And um, there's been a lot of work with this COG state battery and it's shown in aging populations and it's shown that if for each year of increasing age, there's worse cognitive performance on speed and attention and learning and working memory tasks. So we thought these tasks would be sensitive to accelerated aging. Um, so just to talk about psychomotor motor speed and attention. So these are simple tasks that are used with playing cards. Um, I mean, the, the images are of playing cards. And it tests your, it's accuracy, but we're mainly interested in people's speed. Has the card turn over? Yes or no. Is the card red? Yes or no. And it's really on looking at accuracy and speed, but uh, mainly on speed. And what we found was that um, elevated PTSD symptoms were associated with sig significantly worse psychomotor speed or attention, if you look over here. And then we looked at the learning and working memory and had similar results. So just to get a brief sense of the task, is have you seen this card before, yes or no? Have you seen this card before? And then um, is the previous card the same? That's the one back task, yes or no? And we also found that um, elevated PTSD was associated with significantly worse, not, you know, not in a major way, um, significantly worse learning and working memory. And that the mean difference, if we looked at um, for uh, the, uh, the people with PTSD that's, that were positive on our screen versus, versus those were not, was about uh, related to about four years of increased aging, which isn't a huge effect, but it's not, you know, not nothing. And then we've also looked at the adverse effects of trauma and PTSD across generations. So um, one of the things we're able to do in this cohort is there's another cohort called the Growing Up Today study, which is the, the children of the women in the nurses' health study so, um, that have been followed. And so we were able to link the data between the moms and the, their kids. Um, and um, that wasn't the original plan of the studies, but we were able to sort of opportunistically do that. And so what we found, first we just looked simply at trauma and PTSD in the moms and trauma and PTSD in the kids because we wanted to see if, um, if we found associations in this. This is sort of, it's sort of just a community sample of women and kids. They were, so the women were selected because they're nurses, so it's not a special population. A lot of this work has been done, for example, in um, children of Holocaust survivors or refugees or people exposed to extreme traumas, but this is more sort of average kind of average kind of community experience. And so what we found is that when children of mothers were PTSD were exposed to more traumatic events. So if you look at um, mom's number of PTSD symptoms on our screen, if you, have, if you look, compare those with none versus um, those with six or seven, you can see that um, women with more PTSD, their kids were exposed to more traumatic events. And then not surprisingly, these kids also had more PTSD symptoms. Um, 
And then we got interested, um, we'll go to that in a second, and then we got interested in, well, do we see, so that's sort of obvious, and do we see, though, do we see effects of mom's trauma on their kids for things that are less expected? And we decided to focus on mom's abuse history, so mom's history of being abused as a child, because we knew that trauma happened well before her kids were born. Um, in this case, some of these could be, we tried to look at it, but some of them could be shared traumas if the mom and the kid were exposed to disaster or a house fire or something. So we wanted to see if mom's experience of abuse was related to outcomes in her kids. And we also wanted to look at outcomes beyond mental health outcomes, because we felt like there's been a lot of work done on mom's trauma history and, for example, depression in her kids. So we, wanted to, we started looking at some health behaviors, because when we started looking, these, these, these uh, people were sort of adolescents going into really early adulthood. And so what we found is that, and we were surprised by this, that children of mothers who were abused were more likely, for example, with the smoking, to be in a high-risk smoking trajectory. They were more likely to start smoking early and maintain smoking. So this is a mom's experience of abuse from none to severe. This is a composite measure of physical, sexual, um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and um, emotional, or emotional abuse neglect. And, um, these are, uh, the smoking is assessed in the, in the kids, and you can see that moms with severe abuse, they're, um, they have a higher proportion of kids who are in this early initiator, high consumption trajectory. Um, if you compare this, for example, to moms with non or low abuse. Similarly with BMI, um, we found that um, children of moms who are abused had higher BMIs and higher risk weight trajectories. So if you look at um, this over here, this is the moms, this is the kids of the moms with severe abuse or moderate to severe abuse. And you can see that they have you know, pretty consistently, for the severe abuse, pretty consistently higher BMIs or maybe here, and that they're on this higher risk weight trajectory. And what was striking is that we've continued to see that, that this higher risk, risk weight trajectory continues after the kids um, are less likely to be home. They, I mean, this generation of kids are more likely to maybe be home longer, but um, these kids are, they're sort of getting into adulthood when perhaps you would think that it's not just about what the family's eating, et cetera. They have more sort of um, autonomy over that. And they're actually, this high risk weight trajectory is increasing. Um, what's nice about the nurses' data is these data um, are the same if you look at moms who are non-smokers. So it's not about just about mom smoking. And similarly, we have very good data on the mom's BMI, so we can actually show that this is the same in women who have normal BMIs. This, is, um, this cohort is probably a little bit physically healthy. You imagine nurses' health study, nurses aren't always healthier, but they're sort of a little bit, on average, healthier than, the, than women of their same age. Um, and then I just wanted to mention another. So we've done this work, and what's been really striking is that um, We've, uh, there's been some really interesting work by other groups that takes this even further. So I wanted to bring attention to this study, which a, a former colleague of mine did, which I thought was really interesting. So it looked at um, um, wartime evacuation to foster homes um, in, um, so in Finland, they evac evacuated kids um, to foster homes during World War II. And, um, they looked at, so there have been a lot of studies of the kids who were evacuated and the adverse effects of evacuation on the kids. So just like in England, I think, people, I didn't know that much about the Finnish evacuation, but I've heard more about the Engl in, in England, how they evacuated kids from London to the countryside. And um, I think there's a lot of data now that the separation from the family might have been worse for those who were separated than being exposed to the war. So they did it to protect the kids, but in the end, Maybe we're not surprised now, but in the end, the actually being separated from your family and being in a foster situation was actually maybe worse. So they've studied the, the kids, the people who are you know, elderly now, they've studied them, and now they're studying their children. And in this, this study, which I found was really interesting, they found that um, if your mom was evacuated, you were more likely to have, um, you are more likely to have a psychiatric hospitalization. So this is all with um, the, the, the National Health Registry. So they don't have cases of like mental health that aren't, in, that aren't, you don't see a doctor or don't have data in the registry. But you can see that um, if your maternal, if your mom was evacuated, you were more likely to have um, um, 
be, you're, you're more likely to uh, be hospitalized for a psychiatric disorder, so it's pretty severe. And they also were able to look at this within cousins. So they did the overall cohort, and what they found is if you looked within cousins, you found similar or even stronger effects. That is, when they, it, it, that, the, by looking within cousins, because in families, sometimes some cousins were sent and some cousins weren't, you can control for a lot of family variables by looking within cousins. So I thought this really kind of speaks to a, um, some of the power of this cross-generational traumatic experience. Good study. I don't know what happened here. I lost my screen here. I probably, I don't know what I did. Okay, it's fine. I'll be okay. Um, so um, the other thing, so I didn't want to leave it on. So obviously I'm talking about PTSD, trauma and PTSD are common and they have these negative effects on women in their lives, but also across generations. Um, but I didn't want to sort of leave it there and I want to now turn talk about treatment. So one of the things we've been looking at in the cohort is whether effectively treating PTSD can attenuate some of these adverse effects. And my background, I'm a professor in epidemiology now, but I'm actually, my PhD is in clinical psychology. So I've always, I'm always very interested in, you know, can treatment help? I mean, I hope it can. Can it, can it help beyond the mental health symptoms for physical health? And so um, these, oh, this is a crowded slide, but what we were able to do in this cohort, because again, we have this large cohort, and we have information on women over time, we don't have great information on mental health treatment, the kind that you or I would really want. But what we can look at is whether women's symptoms persist or whether they remit and how that's related to health. So if you look here, you can see that women with um, severe ongoing PTSD symptoms have increased risk of, um, of incident and they, severe, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. You can see that here and here. Um, and then if you look at women whose symptoms didn't persist but remitted, they have no increased risk of cardiovascular disease, even if they had had severe symptoms. So even women with severe PTSD over time, after their symptoms remit, they um, have no increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So again, this isn't treatment, it's not a treatment trial, but it's some observational data that suggests that treating PTSD or that symptom remission may also um, have some positive effects, or at least attenuate some of the negative effects we see on health, which is you know, to, to think about something positive. Um, the other thing we know, um, and I'm sure people here are aware, is that most persons with PTSD or mental disorders don't get any mental health treatment. So these are data from the World Mental Health Surveys, um, and so they're global data, um, which look at, these are, so these look at people, so, they've been surveyed and they're diagnosed with PTSD. So, they, so, in, so with a structured interview. Among those people diagnosed with PTSD, what proportion have received mental health treatment? And you can see that it's abysmally low. Um, overall, it's only about like 25%. Um, and um, if you look at in high income countries, even if you look at which the US would be those alone, it doesn't even really get up to past you know, 30%. And if you look at low, low, or upper middle income countries, it's really, really low. And this isn't even saying they're getting good mental health treatment, it just means that they're saying that they saw a mental health specialist. So it's pretty, it's pretty limited. Um, that, that being said, we actually know there are effective treatments for PTSD. And so um, one of the things I don't have data on, but I'm very interested in is can these effective treatments also reduce all these other adverse effects, whether it's on women's or women or men's um, physical health across generations or on their accelerated aging. And I was just talking to Chris and I heard about um, his, the diet treatments, um, which is very interesting now, I'm very interested in that keto treatment, keto diet. Um, I'm gonna talk about, um, about the tr treatment that I've been most involved with. I mean, people here, there's a there's number of trauma-informed treatments. So this is one I'm in, I've been involved in developing, so I'm gonna speak about that and happy to answer questions about that or end about how this relates to other treatments. So, um, and people here might not be as aware of this treatment, because I don't think it's been disseminated as much. So this was a treatment that um, really was led the development by Marilyn Kloitra, and it's called um, STARE slash prolonged exposure. Um, and, or STARE now, it, now it's called STARE narrative therapy, which is, there's a story I can tell you about that. But STARE is skills training and effective and interpersonal regulation, and the narrative therapy is really a trauma-focused therapy. 
And the idea behind the treatment, which um, I got involved in this when I did my clinical internship in New York, and she was developing the treatment. And so I got to, I got to, as an intern, which was really great, I got to work on a treatment development, on treatment development and a treatment development trial. Um, and so the idea behind this treatment is a two module treatment where the first module is really focused, on, is very skills based on interpersonal and emotion regulation skills. And then the second module and that the, the patient has to complete, the client has to complete that module and then you move on to the narrative therapy. And it was really based in Marilyn's and, and other people I know's um, observation that some clients really need trauma focused treatment but they're not ready for it and that it can be overwhelming to go right to the trauma-focused treatment. And so it tries to balance um, present focus, so skills-based work, with past focus, which is the more trauma-based work. And um, some of the data that drove the development of this treatment from Marilyn was that um, in her, when she studied the patients she was seeing in her trauma clinic, she found that emotion regulation and interpersonal problems impacted functioning as much and you know over and above PTSD symptoms. So even if you address PTSD symptoms, this dysregulation in emotions and interpersonal problems had a big negative impact on her patients' lives, um, which you know I'm sure people here have observed. So um, in our, so STARE narrative therapy focuses on three treatment targets, the emotion regulation problems, the interpersonal problems, and then PTSD as well. In the first module, um, you talk about, you focus on emotion regulation, and here are some of the skills, and I'm happy to answer some questions about this, but um, it talks about um, being aware of emotions, naming emotions, some really basic emotion regulation skills, first identifying your feelings, um, experiencing them in your body, how does your body um, tell you about your feelings and taking care of your body, um, focusing on the mind and emotion surfing and some other things I think people are much more, much more familiar with now than when we developed, we first worked on this. Um, and then behavior, self-mastery and social connections. And then in connection, it really focuses on relationships and relationship patterns. So some of the things that you do in that part of the therapy is you do a lot of role playing, identifying interpersonal challenges or issues that come up, role playing them with the patient, identifying, you know, what's triggering to them or what are their, what are their schemas, um, often related, these were mainly, it was mainly developed with women who had childhood abuse, so how might this be tapping into their abuse related, um, how they understood relationships with other people based on their abuse, sort of targeting that and working through that. Um, and then the narrative therapy part is um, originally, in the original treatment, we did prolonged exposure, and then over time that's been modified. Um, we did classic prolonged exposure is how I was trained. Um, and um, this is, it's actually the narrative therapy part is very similar to prolonged exposure, but because um, um, NFO really trademarked prolonged exposure, it's, it, unless you do it exactly like she trains you, you're not allowed to call it prolonged exposure. I don't know if you've ever um, seen Edna talk about that, but she, she doesn't like it if you call it that and you're not doing it exactly her way. So this is very similar to um, where you do sort of an exposure-based um, trauma narration, and then you go through the, the narratives and identifying feelings, beliefs, et cetera, and, those, and then how they relate to, um, since you've already gone through the skills-based part, how they relate to, for example, your maybe challenges with emotion regulation and with interpersonal problems. Um, and so one of the questions is always like, how is this different from other empirically-based trauma-related therapies that people might be familiar with? is that it was really developed for um, survivors of childhood abuse, so it's based on an attachment-based model and not as much on a fear conditioning model. It's um, really focused on current functioning for the first half of the treatment before getting into past trauma. Um, and um, there's a lot of psychoeducation on emotion regulation and our personal problems and how they relate to trauma, but there is a trauma processing component, which is the narrative therapy. It's also different from DBT um, is that it's, it, it is trauma focused, it's created for trauma patients, but DBT is where you're used with a wider variety, not necessarily trauma patients. It's a shorter treatment that is given in group or individual, so it doesn't have all the other components of DBT. And um, you know, usually patients who need, really need DBT would not probably be ideal for this treatment, which is usually done as an outpatient treatment. Um, 
And so this is some comparison, and I'm happy to answer questions about um, why, but it, uh, they're different. But, but I, would, I view them as they're usually for pretty different populations, um, although there's a lot of components in the treatment that are similar. And um, if people are interested in, um, there actually is a STAIR webinar on the National Center for PTSD website for CEU credits that, um, that, is, that is freely available, like really anything, like all the research on the National Center. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, if you're interested, and you can get that. And if people don't get that, you can always email me and I can send you the link. And we do have a second edition of the book coming out in this year, hopefully. Um, if it, yeah, hopefully it'll be out this year, um, which is um, similar to what I talked about, but included in that is a lot of more of the work. Um, over the years, Maryland has really expanded STAIR P to STAIR to um, wider trauma populations, really focused on chronic interpersonal trauma. But she's also used it, for example, with. Um, first responders in the 9-11 terrorist attacks, because she and I, we were all in, in New York on 9-11. Um, and so um, it's been, and that's sort of discussed in the book as well. So just to conclude, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, sadly, women's lives, as many people are know, many women's lives, as people here probably know, are really marked by, by exposure to violence and trauma from early childhood through adolescence into adulthood. And um, you know, my work has really been trying to understand this trajectory of trauma in women's lives and then how it relates to her, um, to their functioning in her, in her life course from birth until death. And here's some acknowledgments. These are different students and postdocs and trainees who've worked on the um, work that I presented today. Um, and this is our, my funders, which is from NIH and um, and Cohen Veterans Bioscience primary funders now. And I also always like to acknowledge all the people that are doing work on trauma broadly and trying to prevent trauma because actually um, we do need to also work, although I'm very focused on treating PTSD, we also need to work on preventing trauma to make sure that, um, you know, to really protect future generations. And so I'll stop there and I think I have time for questions. Thank you very much. Fantastic presentation, thank you. Uh, there, I'm, I just happen to know about, I'm not sure if the FDA has approved it yet, but there's a test, a panel of tests called the plasma stroke biomarker that, is, that includes tests of systemic inflammation, oh, okay. such as uh, metalloproteinase, you know, uh, and also of, of uh, thromboembolic risk uh, with, with D-dimer, and also some brain markers that, that are supposed, you know, it's, that's being validated and is mentioned today in the press because a paper came out today showing that its effectiveness. So something would be fantastic to study be, in, right. in, this, in this group of patients to see it as uh, what the intent, the, whether that inflammatory um, gradations and also maybe some brain uh, markers correlate with it. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering with the cognitive impact that you were noting, how do you separate that from like in the moment, just concentration impact versus like the cognitive marker of aging? Yeah, so I think that um, we, right, we don't really know the mechanism. So it could be, so we see this effect with like PTSD, but it could be that, it could be that are the women more, we don't know why. Is the women more anxious in the moment and just generally have more trouble concentrating and thus don't do as well on the test? We don't know versus like is PTSD damaging their brain? We don't know that. Um, one of the things I want to do, I have a supplement on that project in to do, um, to do other cognitive tests with the women, with Laura Germain who's here. Um, and I think that the battery she has developed would be much better for getting at more sophisticated questions like that. This battery, uh, when, we, when they started using, they wanted something in the cohort that was web-based. It, like it was a long time ago, and there were very limited options available, so they sort of started with this, but it wouldn't be, I, like, I think using something like test my brain would be much better now. 
then what with that when this is available? With regard to the um, the maternal transmission of trauma, the idea of the whip, um, what happens to their kids when their trauma was before, um, are your hypotheses about that more on the psychological side of things or more on the physiological? I think either could be happening, and the kind of cohorts that I work in, it's, I mean, so. It's harder to tease those things apart. So we find things like, like in our cohorts, we find things that are definitely psychological. So women who are abused, more likely to be depressed, their kids are more likely to be depressed. So it, there's, that partly, partly explains it. There's also, they have more challenging relationships with their kids. There can be, um, it's related to, they have measures, but these are self-report measures of attachments. So they're not like what we think the best, but they tend to be more discordant reports of attachment or relationship between moms and their kids, so it could be that. Um, and then there could be, I mean, Carrie, who's here, has done a lot of work on the on epigenetics and other transmissions, so it could be, could be all of the, any, any of the above, and I think we don't know the contribution. It's hard to have the studies that can look at the contribution of all the different levels, so great, it could be either. Yeah, yeah, you had your hand up before. So I wondered if your nurse's study looked at cancer as one of the adverse health outcomes from women who had experienced trauma or PTSD. Yes, so we have, I actually didn't, I didn't, there's no good reason I didn't include it. Um, we have um, a paper looking at PTSD and, and it shows increased risk of ovarian cancer. So we found increased risk of ovarian cancer, which was a finding I actually, when we found it, I totally didn't believe. I, I was convinced it was re reverse causality. I was convinced that it was women. I mean, we know that diagnosis of cancer, people can have PTSD symptoms at least, and some studies show PTSD diagnosis. So I was convinced it was like these women knew they had ovarian cancer and they developed PTSD, and that's why we saw this. It's like about a twofold increased risk of ovarian cancer. But that is our main finding. We have not found evidence association with breast cancer or other cancers, mainly with ovarian. And I have no idea why, because ovarian is one of the least explained by lifestyle factors. Um, so that can't really explain it. I should also say with the health outcomes we look at, um, we only find that health behaviors explain a, a small proportion of the relationships. It's not all explained by, you know, by smoking or weight gain or whatever. Um, so we're, we're actually not able to explain. And, that, and actually in this cohort, we have very good health behavior data. So that doesn't seem to explain it. So this gets back at the even cross-generation or there seems to be something else going on. Something else going on. Um, beyond just, it's not just that women with PTSD are less healthy and then they get these diseases, there's other things going on. In the diabetes, um, the biggest explanatory variable between PTSD and diabetes was antidepressant use, which when we did the, we published the paper, again, we weren't, we didn't, we weren't expecting it, we just, we adjusted, for, we were adjusting for antidepressant use because it can have weight effects, et cetera. That was the thing like everyone wanted to talk about. So I don't know why I'm not, a, you probably have people here in the audience who are much more expert than I am who could explain it, but that was one of the biggest reasons for the association. Yeah. Hi there. In the slide that you showed on cardiovascular risk diminishing in people who had uh, PTSD and remission, did you guys study kind of the, the length of time that the individual had PTSD before they were in remission? Was there a correlation between uh, the duration of PTSD symptoms, like for instance, if you have severe PTSD but it resolves in a year versus in 20 years, does that uh, confer different risk for cardiovascular? We risk? try to look at that. I wouldn't say we have. We don't have. We don't really have the the most fine grained data to look at that. It does seem like um, the longer you have PTSD, the worse it is, but we don't have, you know, ideally you'd have much more fine-grained data so you could really look at both how long people have it and how long they don't have it. And then we do know that, at least I've seen clinically, but also there are some observational studies that PTSD can wax and wane a bit in some people, so we don't have great data on that. So I think those are, we don't, that's a 
good thing we question we don't know really. Yes. Oh, yes. The studies um, include people with CPSD, um, oh, complex. Yes. It, it yeah, so all, probably yeah. there are women in there with complex PTSD. We don't have like a great in the big in the data I showed, we don't have a great what I would say is a great measure of complex PTSD. We just did another survey of this cohort in 2018, where we included some other things. Um, we were able to do it online now, so that is. And when I did this, it was we did it. They mailed questionnaires to, you know, 60,000 women, but um, now they do it online, so we were able to ask more questions, and we included questions about like emotion regulation and other association and other things that we don't have in those. So then we'll see if there's more, when we have that data clean, we'll see, have a better sense of how much complex PTSD. But I'm sure these women actually report pretty high levels of childhood abuse. Um, again, for a cohort that's not, it's not a clinical cohort, about, about a quarter have pretty significant childhood physical and sexual abuse. And we ask very behaviorally, like have, you know, we ask very behavioral questions. So I would, I would expect there is. But we don't, we can't really test it. Yeah. So I want to ask a question, and I want to make an announcement before everybody leaves. Um, if you don't know, so McLean Hospital is sponsoring a conference on post-traumatic stress disorder next month, late le next month. And for those who aren't trained in prolonged exposure but might want to become trained in prolonged exposure, there's a two-day workshop um, led by Sheila Rausch, who uh, oh, yeah, that's is great. Yeah. certified and trained to make it official. Um, but so now my question. So you presented data that children of women who have a, um, a history of abuse are more likely to be abused themselves. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering what factors you may have controlled for in analyzing that data. For for example, so if if a nurse was in the lowest percentile of socioeconomic status. We know that people in poor neighborhoods are more likely to experience trauma, abuse, muggings, whatever, um, and 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 therefore their children would, uh, you know, presume to be you know exposed to that same environmental kind of toxicity, and so I'm wondering what types of factors you controlled for to to look at that. So we tried to look at those common factors. So one thing we looked at is we we did analyses with and without um, what we, we, we thought might be shared traumas. So they also could, like I said, the moms and the kids might, um, I don't know, if there's a disaster, they might both have that because, you know, it hit their town or whatever. Um, and then we also looked at, we control for SES, and then we also look within, like, SES groups, and the relationships were consistent. I will say, though, in the nurses, this is, I mean, these were all women who were, um, at the time of enrollment, they would have they needed a two-year nursing degree, so they didn't need a four-year degree like now. But it is women who um, were like functional and doing well and had everything well enough in the world that they went on and got a professional degree and then registered as nurses. So it's not like a general population cohort. You don't have the whole. We have some range, but we don't have like the whole range of SES you might want to see. Um, it's also at the time it reflects nursing. It was majority this group cohorts majority white, like vast majority white. Well, the, there's a nurses three cohort, which is much more diverse. Um, so there's, it, it's also a restrained, kind of constrained group that answers. Great, thanks. Can you say anything about whether estrogens have an impact on the high-end severe PTSD or not? That is, a, is it possible that they're either beneficial or detrimental? That's a good, I, I don't know. I'm actually very, I, I find that very interesting and I don't, I don't know, but I think there, there are people who are interested in that and working on that and so I don't know any conclusive evidence either way. Um, there's also uh, Suzanne Pinellas who um, is at the Boston VA. She's done these really interesting fear conditioning studies where she looks at women at different phases in the um, menstrual cycle and um, does tests to see where estrogen, where their own estrogen, progesterone, are and finds differences in fear conditioning and extinction depending on where women are in their menstrual cycle. And someone who is much more expert on hormones could say more about that, but there is a lot of interest and some evidence that estrogens might be related. Um, 
some interesting things. We have some findings that I didn't show because they're, they're just developing on that women with PTSD are more likely to be put on hormone replacement therapy. Um, they're more also more likely to have um, uh, earlier menopause, um, particularly, actually, particularly surgical menopause. There does seem to be these, and then there's, um, actually, Carrie, again, has some findings related to genes related to estrogen and PTSD. So there's, there's these kind of different things around there. I don't think anyone's ex exactly addressed your question, but I think it's an interesting one. Have you seen any impact on physical health outcomes that are specific to having more dissociative symptoms of the PTSD presentation? I haven't. Um, and I think usually, so in this cohort, we don't really have those symptoms. In the new data, we will have better, better information on that. And I think most of the studies out there don't have, they probably just don't collect that data. Or a lot of the studies are in these big health registries or like the VA registry, so the VA system. So they have like PTSD diagnosis, but they don't have that. But I think that's, that's something I'm actually interested in too and how the different um, sort of P symptom clusters of PTSD relate. Um, I think we, we have one, a postdoc of mine did one paper which found that for hypertension, it was really the fear, the um, re-experiencing that was most related to increased risk of hypertension, less so the other symptoms. Uh, but we didn't have like dissociative symptoms for that, so. Can I just ask you to speak about the resiliency that you found in those that maybe met criteria but weren't symptomatic? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, we're, we're actually really interested in that as well. Um, and then another thing that's interesting in terms of resilience is a slide I don't show anymore because I always raise a lot of questions is we have um, independently, we have mom's report of her own abuse and trauma, right? And then we have the kids with the same measures, their reports of their own abuse and trauma. And we find the moms have much higher prevalences of being abused than the kids do which is something I've always been interested because in, you talk about the, the you know, intergenerational trans transmission, but it seems to be reduced. So I've always wanted to understand that. Um, and so in the, um, in the, you know, and I can say in terms of resilience, we're working on that and how to define that because it's always challenging because trauma tracks so much with PTSD that defining women who are similarly exposed to trauma, but don't have PTSD is, challenging in the kinds of data we have. But I think you see a lot of resilience if you just look at, um, um, I don't know if I can go back quickly enough, but if you just look at, um, you know, among women with, with, with severe abuse, for example, like still most of her kids don't have PTSD. Most of the kids are, by all measures, most of those women are still doing well. So not a great answer. I hope in the future I'll have a better answer to that. Any uh, measures of possible protective buffers, like optimism, um, in this cohort? <laughs> yeah, so my um, colleague that I work with on all this, she's, like, she's the head of the um, Happiness Center at Harvard. So she's, she's always like, you sound like, I'm like, you plant, Laura, planted people. Um, um, we, we actually included measures of optimism. They, they do in the cohort um, recently. And in our, in our 2018 survey, we have, um, measures of optimism and life purpose. Um, so not great, and we don't have them, that his, we'll have them now going forward, but we don't have them historically as much. And the other things we, ha we have, we're now looking at things, we have measures of social support and community involvement that um, people are kind of looking at now, but the optimism and stuff is, um, in, is going forward, we'll have more on that. I, actually, that, that uh, brings up a question because so the Harvard um, kind of the long-term uh, healthy aging uh, uh, study that looked at uh, medical students back I think in, oh, in the yeah. 1940s or something I think one of the strongest protective factors they found were relationships so people who are married people who had a good cohort of friends people who are connected to their families did you look at anything like that in this population we could we you know we really haven't um, looked at. They do have data on, anyone in the questionnaires we used, we did have data on relationships and like social, it's um, social interconnectedness, I guess it's called, because it's like how you ask about the relationships, the whole area that I'm not expert in, but um, people could look at that, definitely, but we haven't really. 
should all go and get your prolonged exposure training. <laughs> I did the um, training with um, Ed Nafoa back in the day, back with my internship, and did a prolonged, ex that's how I'm trained in prolonged exposure. And it's, it's like just a really satisfying treatment. It really, I mean, not to say it really works. So when you do it, it's really amazing to see patients who come in, and I was working in a clinic where they mostly saw people with chron very chronic PTSD from abuse and violence. And you have people who came in who'd had PTSD for decades, and then you do exposure, and they're like, better. It was really, really amazing. So I encourage folks to get that training. No others? Well, let's have another round of applause for Dr. Conan. Thank you so much.